Okay, so now I want to go over a few preliminary notions which are going to be useful throughout what we're going to go on to discuss. So it's good to get used to these kind of ideas now. So I'm going to discuss sets and maps. So a set is probably one of the most primitive mathematical objects which we can define. And it's simply just a collection of what we call elements. So A and B, say, are going to be elements of the set X, and we could have a potentially infinite number of elements. So, as I've said, the set is a fairly primitive object. It has basically no structure. All the set can really know is whether or not an element is in the set or not. So this is characterized by something called the relation epsilon, and this epsilon simply means an element is in the set. So if I write A in X, this is effectively a logical statement. We're not going to need to go too deep into discussing uh, the formal logic behind this statement. We just simply take it to be a true statement that means that element A lies in the set X. So just as equally as an element can be in a set, there is the opposite notion of an element not being in the set. So if we have some other element alpha, we can write that this is not the kind of negated version of this in relation. This is not in the set X. So this is really all the set can know, whether or not an element is in the set or not. So there's basically no structure to a set other than the fact that it's just a collection of elements. So now that we've understood what a set is, it's just a collection of things, we can go on to construct some more slightly interesting objects. So if we have two sets now, say X and Y, I'm going to call the elements of the X set little x, and I'm going to label them by a subscript I, so xi, where i will just be a, a label at 1, 2, or 3, is an element of the x set. And then similarly, for the y set, we're going to have yi. So another object which we can construct now out of these two sets is the so-called Cartesian product. So the Cartesian product of these two sets, which is given the symbol x multiplied or cross y, this whole thing is just another set, so I'm going to write it in curly brackets so we're clear that this entire object is just a set. And now the elements of this set are what we call ordered pairs. So really I should write that the ordered pair is in the Cartesian product. And now this pair, an ordered pair, the first kind of slot if you like is the element that comes from the first set in the Cartesian product. So this is going to be any one of the xi's. And the second element comes from the second set in the Cartesian product. So this is going to be one of the yi's. So the x, the first element comes from the first set, and the second element from the second set and this is the notion of ordered in the ordered pair. We have to respect, or the ordering of these elements tells you which of these sets that they came from. So we could potentially have more than two sets. We could consider the Cartesian product of any number of sets. So we take d lots of a set and we Cartesian product. And then the elements of this set is just going to be what we call a D tuple, which is effectively just a list of numbers with D entries, and each entry is going to come from the corresponding set. So a two tuple is commonly just called a double, a three tuple, a triple, and then as we go on we just refer to them as D tuples. Okay, so I'll just do a really quick example now. 
if we say have the set x being the element a, b, and the set y being c, d. Now let's consider forming the Cartesian product of these two sets. So x Cartesian product y, we know this whole thing is just another set, but the elements of this Cartesian product set are now pairs of numbers. So what are the pairs of numbers going to be? Well, it's just going to be all the possible combinations of these pairs that we can make. So we're going to have A and C, then A and D, then B and C, B and D. So now you'll notice that Elements from the x set always appear in the left hand slot, and elements from the y set always appear in the, the right hand slot. This is just because we need to respect the ordering in the Cartesian product, and that's why we refer to these as ordered pairs. So that's the kind of basic uh, construction we can do with a set. If we have any number of sets, we can form these ordered pairs of the, their elements. So, so now I want to consider another notion which is that of a map. So if we have two sets, x and y, say, we can construct what is called a map from one set into the other set. And now I'm going to call the map F. So this should be read as the map F takes elements from x and maps them into elements in y. So it's convenient to express this in terms of elements now. So if I say that xi is an element in x, and now this is potentially a new symbol, but it just means there exists. So there exists some element yi in the y set such that this yi is equal to the action of the map on the original element x. Can we write that like this? So this kind of should resemble a function star notation. We'll see that a function is in fact just an example of a map. So this just means that the element y, which comes from the set that we're mapping into, we express it in this way, which means that the map maps the element x into the element y. So you might see this usually written as xi, as an individual element now, is mapped to, so that's what this arrow with the line means, it map, it, this is how a single element is mapped, maps to the element y, which is this f acting on the xi. So this is frequently called the image. The image of the element x is y under the action of the map f. And now it's kind of easy and convenient to visualize this in the following way. So if I imagine our two sets now is just these kind of abstract blobs, this is the set x, this is the set y. We're going to have some elements in x, I'll denote them as crosses, and then the y elements, say, can be little boxes. And now the map f is constructed by simply defining how each of these elements in the, now this is terminology, the domain, so the set that we're mapping from we refer to as the domain, and then the set that we're mapping into we refer to as the codomain, or in looser language the target set, target or range set. So then to construct the map F, we simply need to define how the map acts on each of the elements. So I could construct potentially any sort of map, I'll just do an arbitrary one, that element's going to here, this one to there, that one to there, and 
that one can go to this one, and this one can go to that one. So I just defined that fairly arbitrarily. The actual definition of the map will be defined in context more concretely, but for now we're just thinking abstractly. The definition of a map is that it takes an element from one set and assigns it to an element in another set. So that last map I define fairly arbitrarily. I just now want to discuss a few different classes or types of map that we can have. So the first class of map is called an injective map, which means that every element in the, co in the domain is mapped to a single element in the codomain. And we could ne not necessarily map to every element in the domain. There could be an element which isn't hit by the map. But each element can only map to a single element. So that would be an injective map. Another type of map is called surjective. So in the surjective case, we could have that two elements in the domain map to the same element in the codomain. So the key point for being a surjective map is that every element in the domain maps to at least one element in the codomain. And then finally, if a map is both injective and surjective, it's what's known as bijective. So to be injective we had to have that each element only maps to a single element, and then to be surjective we must have that each element must map to at least one element, and we can't have any unmapped two elements. So if the map is both injective and surjective, it's bijective. So other terminology which is commonly used is that an injective map is called a one-to-one -one map, i.e. one element maps to one element. A surjective map is sometimes called an onto map, which kind of just means that all of the elements map to at least one element. And then if a map is both one-to-one -one and onto, it's bijective. So a bijective map is going to be the kind of map which we're most interested in, because if we can construct a bijective map between two sets, then those two sets are said to be what's called, or that then those two sets are said to be isomorphic. With a slight caveat that this map has to be invertible, meaning that if we map from the domain to an element, there should be a concrete way to tell me how to go in the other, other direction. So if two sets are said to be isomorphic, that simply means that we can construct a bijective map or a bijection between the two sets. And what this kind of means is that the elements of one set can be talked about as being the same, in a sense, as the elements of the other set, because we can just freely move between them through this bijection. So I, I briefly mentioned there the inverse map. We can only define an inverse map for the surjective and the bijective case. If we look at the injective case, we see why we can't define an inverse, because, well, in order to define a map, firstly, we have to map every element from the domain. However, in the injective case, this element here is not mapped to by any element from the domain, so it has an undefined inverse. So we can only define an inverse in the case where every element is mapped onto. And, kind of, heuristically, the inverse map you just follow the arrow in the other direction to obtain from the target set what its corresponding element that was mapped onto it is. So just to summarise then, a set is simply a collection of elements 
we can kind of visualize discrete sets as the, these blobs with points as being the elements, we can then construct a map between two sets, which is simply just an assignment of the elements of one set into the elements of another set. And then we have these three different classes of the possibilities that the map might be. And in the case where the map is surjective and bijective, it makes sense to talk about the inverse map. And just a bit more terminology, the inverse map is frequently denoted with a minus one power. And then if our two sets are what's known as bijective, or rather if our two sets are isomorphic, that simply means we can construct a bijection between the two sets. So every element is kind of identified with a single element in the other set. And then the two sets, we can just freely move between them by the fact that we can construct this bijection. And that means in some sense they are the same up to an isomorphism.